Um, this is Jason Hill. We'll be going over how to create a compliance and a baseline. So I can thank you for this uh, showing up today. So I take time to thank our sponsors, which are the Kennesaw State Department of Information Systems, the NSA, and Core Security of Health Systems. Without this, um, we don't have these sides. So without further ado, it's Jason Hill. Now, I will go ahead and apologize because um, I found out this morning that I have strep throat, and that's exactly the sickness you want to have when you're doing a presentation. So I'm going to be drinking a lot of that uh, and taking a break. So, like you said, uh, my name is uh, Jason Hill. I, as it says up on this big screen right here, I'm the Director of Strategic Services for Cybrient. It's a, we're an MSSP uh, doing things uh, you know, manage firewall, manage sim, manage blah, 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 blah. Um, we, I manage the teams that do the uh, assessments, the audits, the, uh, the penetration testing, and things like that. And so, just to give you an idea of why I am talking about this, why we kind of came up with making this a service, and yes, we are going to be talking about our, our uh, secret sauce, it's not really secret sauce, it just seems that way to people that um, don't really have the, the, um, the, the capacity or the, uh, the team to do, do this. It seems like secret sauce, but really it's stuff that's public, it's all from uh, COVID and NIST and things like that. We'll talk about that a bit later. But what, what I've seen when I've gone and done audits, I was a PCIQSA as well, um, and when I go and do an audit, I hear pretty much the same thing over and over, which is, man, we just got complete, ready for you to show up, and then we're good to go on PCI, we think, this year. And you know, as soon as you're out of here, we're going to switch gears, and we're really going to go on, fill in one of the alphabet soups. HIPAA, GLBA, NIST, whatever it happens to be, right? And so, nine times out of ten, Whenever I do an assessment, whenever I do an audit, what happens is it's going from one firefighting to another. And my little guy, And so what we discovered over time is that the current process is broken, how most people address their compliances or their regulations, whatever it happens to be. Most of the time it is, let's look at the controls, let's apply the controls before the audit, let's rush, 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 get it done. Oh, we're done. Okay, we don't have to do this again until next year. And then next year it happens. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Something that is coming to a head is that we have more and more and more compliances that are coming down the road, right? So we have GLBA that hit a few years ago, GDRP that hit a few years ago. Um, in 800-171 is now required for anybody who has any government data. That includes schools, because student loans technically are government data. So all of these compliances are coming down the road. There's more and more that you have to address. So that means more and more fires. It means more and more rushing from one to the other. And so I've seen this in large companies and I've seen this in small companies. Not, not all. So some of you in here are going to be sitting through this and going, well, yeah, that's what we do. Great. You are a very small minority. Okay, a very small minority from what I've seen. And so for the rest of you who have compliances that you have to worry about, especially multiple compliances that you have to worry about, this is something that uh, we have successfully deployed at several customers, and it's changed the way they do business. But again, it's not really anything that's, that's secret, and, and when you see this, you'll say, wow, that's completely hidden, nobody knew this. Well, yeah, it's, it's out there, it's just you have to know the process. And so this is what we're gonna be talking about here. Now, you know, let's be honest. Compliance is not something that is sexy, right? So when you go to a party or when you go to one of these events like this and you say, I'm in compliance, you get the glaze and somebody immediately starts thinking, that's wonderful, how do I get out of this conversation? When you say, I'm a penetration tester, 
You either get, that's awesome, I want to talk to you a lot, or what is that? Well, I'm essentially a hacker, and then people light up. But let's be honest. You ask any hacker, you ask any penetration tester worth their salt, what do you need to do in order to be secure? And one, they should tell you, well, you'll never be truly secure. The only way you can be secure is to destroy the data. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is they'll say the boring stuff. Right? So that's the other thing about this talk is they'll say, you know, like one of our top guys that uh, we use, they say, look, patch. Run vulnerability scans every once in a while. Make sure that you uh, have complex passwords. That's all boring stuff. It's all compliance related. But that's really what makes you more secure. So let's talk about what most people do uh, when it comes to uh, their compliance. Okay, so what most people do, this is I've seen it time and time again, completely ignore the problem. Oh, we've got blank compliance out, uh, you know, Back a few years ago, it was, well, we've got to be um, NIST compliant for, by December 31st, 2018. Well, that's like 18 months away. I don't care about that. So you ignore it. Then, about a month away, two months away, three months away, you panic. And you say, oh, this is coming a lot sooner than I thought. There's all these controls, all this documentation I need to do. All of this stuff that needs to happen in order for us to meet these compliances, in order to meet this checklist, and that's what you do. You run around, doing whatever you can, everybody stops everything, projects are halted to get ready for the audit, or at least to get ready for that stage. Now, let's be honest, a lot of times if an auditor is not showing up, it's, well, we should probably do that. It is a law, but we'll get to it, All right? That happens a lot, too. Next, you go into the process. You look at what your current state is, you look at the requirements, you start to make a list of here's all the things we've got to do. You put in your budget all sorts of things that you want to purchase and you say it's required for compliance because otherwise they wouldn't let you buy it. And so you go down the list of what do we got to do, what do we got to do. And then we apply that. And that is normally a fevered rush where, where users are upset because you're making changes so fast that uh, you've got to make this documentation. Maybe you have to bring in a third party to get everything ready. Um, it's, it's a fevered pitch. Then we put in all our security controls. We update our policies and procedures to match the security controls. And we oftentimes we'll put in our policies and procedures in the ideal world. And then there's actually the real world that's separate from the ideal world. Uh, and we run around again. And so we remediate. We put all these changes into place. And we then have the auditor show up. We sacrifice a goat to the audit gods because who knows whether or not we're actually going to be compliant because we've been rushing around uh, like complete idiots this last few months because we're not ready. Then you undergo the audit. And you sit and sweat and worry and say, really hope this is not a resume generating event. And then you repeat. Wow, that's over. Woo, okay, I need a vacation. I'm going to go off. I'm going to drink lots of alcoholic beverages. And then we'll wait until next year again. And that's how most companies deal with, regular, uh, deal with compliance, deal with regulations. I've seen it time and time and time again. I've gone into environments where um, they were being fined fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month because they were not PCI compliant because they did this and thought, well, two months is plenty enough time to get PCI compliant. <laughs> no, um, that does eat into your business, eat into your margin. But wait, there's more problems. And that is the Russian roulette of, or the regulation roulette is what I like to call it, of all these different compliances. Just to give you an idea, at the state level, 
not federal, not local, not international, just the state level. There's currently 265 bills and resolutions that address compliance at just the state level. There's really becoming this point where unless you have a plan, unless you have a mechanism for meeting these compliances, you're not going to meet them. You're just not. Or you've got to keep hiring more and more people to run around in a panic. And that's not really the right way to do it either. Not only that, but we're having more breaches. I don't know about you all, but uh, in, the, in our business, we've seen kind of an inflection point that happened about a year to two years ago, where before that, kind of a watershed, before that, we'd go talk to a company and they would say, well, compliance is just to drain on my income. It just cuts into margin. It doesn't really give me anything. It's kind of like insurance. Um, I, I'm not really all that interested in it. It's not really something that I, I want to do because I'm not really forced to do it. And then we've had breach after breach after breach. You all know all the breaches, you know, Target, Equifax, all, the, all of that. And most of those, guess what? Are because they didn't do the basic stuff. Patch. I mean, come on, that's not that hard. I, um, yeah, I was a system guy, so I know that on the other side of the fence, I'm going to be telling you as the compliance people, I'm not touching my system, it's okay. I'm not touching it because then it'll fall over and everything will be bad, right? But you got to do it. And so because of this, because of these things that are happening, we have more and more uh, situations that lead us to have to be compliant. Not only that, but I don't know if you've noticed, each regulation, each compliance framework believes that they are the only one that exists in the universe. And who cares if you're compliant with 17 other ones? We want to know you, you're watching your logs. We want to know that you're, uh, you have passwords for your users. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're compliant with all the 853 controls, every single one of them. I'm, I'm not going to believe that you're watching your logs. Okay. So then you've got to show it over every single time. And so there's this mishmash of all these different compliances that we have to comply with. Now, if you only have one, or if you have none to comply with, good for you, but that's not going to last. You're going to have to address this at some point. So what we did was we basically said, there's got to be a better way. Of course, there is. I've, I've done um, a, a nine-figure um, security implementation for the Air Force uh, where I was the security lead for that, and you learn quick that there is processes for everything. You want to go to the bathroom, that is a process, that is a regulation, that is a form that you have to fill out, right? And while a lot of that is quite a bit tedious, out, what the intent is, is to make sure that you don't miss any of this stuff. That's what we're going to talk about. So we have a framework. Now what a framework is, if you're not familiar, which you should be, but, but if you're not, um, is it's basically a way that you can go and step by step make sure that you are doing all the things necessary to try to make your, your environment secure. Now, now notice what I said, try to make your environment secure, because as we all know, compliance doesn't mean you're secure. Being secure doesn't mean you're compliant two different things. Now, being compliant helps you get secure. It helps you down the road of secure, but it doesn't. And again, you know, just if you have a vendor, if you have anybody come in and say, this product, this service makes you secure, back away slowly, get out bear spray, and run away. Because nothing makes you secure. If, if a state actor wants your data, they're going to get paid. They're going to. This, though, makes you a little higher up on the echelon of things to have things to get into. So they go for the low hanging fruit first. So the first thing is set up a framework. Pick one. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. They all kind of guide you towards the end result that's the same. Now we use NIST mostly because one, again, if you are doing anything with the government, even remotely related to the government, you have to be compliant. 
Um, there is tons and tons and tons of documentation. If you want to go to sleep tonight and sleep like a baby, try to read through some of the missed documentation. It is painful. But it's complete. And it is, um, it gives you a lot of good recommendations and there's definitely rabbit holes you can go down. It's adaptable. So, I mentioned 853. If you're not familiar with that, this is kind of like the grand poobah of security controls. Uh, if you have um, 53, this is basically saying all possible ramifications. Right? Not only do you monitor your audit logs, but you monitor that your audit logs are still coming in. And so you have watchers that watch the watchers. Things like that. However, you can go down to 171. This is just if you have government data, you need to be compliant with this. And then you can customize 53 all the way down to I think it's something like 60-something controls. But what that means is, depending on the size of your organization, depending on the security that you have, depending on the needs that you have, you can start with this. Now there's the cybersecurity framework that's going to help you in guiding you of where, where are you versus where do you want to go of your maturity level. And then if you really want um, to inflict some pain on yourself, you can do the full risk management framework. And this is where you go in and you really you define your security controls. You make sure that you have uh, your enclave set up for particular things. This is really, honestly, this is for larger organizations. But it's adaptable. And so we work with NIST because it's a good baseline. It sets your baseline. Now, if you all know about NIST and, and have an understanding of that, have an understanding of frameworks, that's great. Where a lot of people fall down, though, is the next few steps we're going to talk about. So when you establish the framework, we'll talk about really getting it up and going. We identify our scope. We identify, here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we're going to um, try to secure, right? So that doesn't mean it has to be your entire environment. You can start with a, a remote office and say, okay, we've gotten that one compliant. Now let's branch off, right? So that's the flexibility of NIST. Others allow you to do that as well. You identify your risk profiles. How secure do we need to make this? What kind of data do we have? How do we need to secure that data? We create a process that supports the framework. Now this, this is where most people fall down. Because to most people, framework, when you hear the word framework, when you hear the word compliance, what you think is, here's a list of things I need to do in my environment. That's what most people think. That is not what a framework is. That is part of a framework. That's like saying, I have a car, and I have four wheels, so great, I have a car. I don't have anything else. There's no doors, there's no engine, there's nothing else, and it's just four wheels. But I have a not really. This is obvious, I think it should be, where you have, you got to get people involved. And you select what you do. Because like I said, except for a few, um, a few specifics, you pick what you want. Right? You pick the security that your environment needs to be. Now, in a lot of times, it's going to be forced upon you. So we use NIST. However, we've had several customers where we start with PCI. Is PCI great framework? Not really. Uh, but if you have to be PCI compliant in six months and you're nowhere near that, well, that's what we start with. And then we kind of meld it into this. So that's where the magic happens. Setting up, for those of you who may not be familiar with the frameworks, and really honestly how they work, not just here's all the controls that we have to do. This is what you got to do. But that's not really the magic. It's coming. So at first, we perform a risk assessment. This, again, is something that a lot of people don't do. Uh, quite frankly, it is very valuable. And again, most people start with a penetration test. That's going a little backwards. You set up everything first, you get all your ducks in a row, then you perform a penetration test. It's like hiring a thief to break into your house and you forget to leave and you leave the front door open. Well, you just paid this person a lot of money to just say, oh, okay, well, thank you. I'm going to take everything you have now. Right? It's the same thing. If you don't perform a risk assessment and know where you are, 
You don't know where you're going. So we identify all the missing documentation. This looks familiar. This is all the stuff that we do when we're preparing and we're in a rush, right? This is, this is everything that, that we do anyway. But again, not really where the magic happens. We establish compensating controls. I always tell clients, this is not compensating controls, this is complicating controls, because when you try to implement compensating controls, it just makes your life hard. Everybody wants to do compli <laughs> Everybody wants to do compensating controls because they think it makes it easier. No, it actually makes it harder if you're doing things properly. You then assess, and this is where you get the audit, and then you perform a risk assessment again because, quite frankly, this is probably a year after you performed the first one. And you need to go through it again just to make sure you've actually implemented everything. For example, we had a customer that we were doing this for. We performed a risk assessment, and they weren't all that bad. They had a lot of next-gen. Fill in the blank, it doesn't really matter. Um, they had a lot of next-gen stuff, and so yeah, you know, their perimeter was kind of secure, and uh, they had some, you know, endpoint protection that was pretty good. And so we went through this process, helped them establish the framework, and did things like that. And uh, we were pretty hands-off about it because they wanted it to do it most themselves. So we perform a risk assessment again. Now this is a large law firm that has clients that you have heard of. And while interviewing people, we find out that the database administrator decided that oh, all these controls really make my job difficult. So I'm going to take a copy of the database on an unencrypted USB and take it home with me to work on the database because that's easy. They were compliant, <coughs> except for that one server. Right? So you need a risk assessment. I have other stories, a lot of other stories like that. And so you've got to perform a risk assessment in order to understand where was I? Did I do a good job? Moving on. Now this is where really what we do is something that a lot of people haven't seen. They may have seen, yes, I know I need to set up a program. I know I need to set up um, my policies and procedures. And the thing is, when you do that with NIST, you have to, you have to put that as part of your operating procedures. That is the thing that 95% of all corporations that I've stepped foot into, that is their problem where they fall down. They have their controls, they put their controls into place, and then they don't monitor it. Then they don't have change control that tracks it, not only tracks that it happened and it has approvals, but also, you update your documentation, you update your security plan, you update your framework. That, that's where a lot of people fall down, and so when they start to get audited, and they know an audit comes, they're not ready. Because, wait a minute, the last time we updated our firewall configuration documentation was two years ago, and we actually put in a new firewall and forgot to update the documentation. I've seen that. So once you do that, great, you've got NIST. What about the others? How many of you in here have more than one compliance that you have to meet? Right, more than one. So the thing is, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Now I just picked PCI and NIST because those are the ones I'm, I'm definitely most familiar with, but you can really insert any acronym here that has to do with compliance, and guess what? You have to audit your logs. You have to watch it, make sure nobody's doing anything wacky. You've got to uh, plan out your disaster recovery, business continuity. You've got to look at your visible security. Now there may be nuances between the two, right, between NIST and PCI. And of course, over here on this Venn diagram, you're going to have, do you have credit card information? But realistically, the vast majority of PCI and NIST overlap. So what then do you do? Well, you don't go and start down PCI and say, okay, are we monitoring our logs? We're NIST compliant, so of course we are, but let's go verify that. No, you already know you are. And so you make that, that's interesting. Okay, so 
Well, okay, I have a few blank slides. Um, so we perform a gap analysis. This is going to say, what about PCI, what about HIPPO, what about whatever is unique compared to the framework that I have. And then you identify the missing documentation. Now guess what? That, take, that takes PCI from this much work to this much work. We have seen, actually we have seen people who are, PC, who are NIST compliant. We have helped become NIST compliant. They have properly implemented everything. Become PCI, and this is a um, multi-million dollar, you're talking probably around 700 seats or so, 700 uh, employees. Uh, I've become PCI compliant in about a month and a half because they've already got everything. They have the matrix set up so that all that's left is those little things, you know, do you, do you, have, uh, do you encrypt the credit card information? Do you even have credit card information? Things like that. We then establish the complicating controls, if we have any. We remediate, and then we maintain. Now this is, again, somewhere where people fall down a lot. If you maintain, if you make it a point that all your processes, whenever the IT staff make a decision, is that going to affect our compliance? If so, we need to put that into our framework. We need to put, make an adjustment. Every decision. Okay, I'm going to you know, rip out this uh, database server and put in a new one because of uh, whatever version is updated. Great, still gotta go in and update your security. Now it's a lot of work, yes, but it means that when an audit comes on, you're ready, you don't have to do anything. Maintaining is going to be a huge part of that. And that's the next point. Constantly stay up to date. This is actually part of a lot of um, compliances that you have to maintain, uh, you know, articles and read stuff. But hopefully you're doing that anyway. And then we test our security controls because guess what? That's what the auditor is going to do. We train employees on the security plan. This happens 2% of the time where we have a, everything in place but the people performing the work, the people making the changes, don't actually know that when they do something, they have to update the security person, the CISO, or whatever it happens to be, uh, that, that that's happening. And then we make adjustments, like I was talking about. That is what you've got to do. Now, is any of this secret sauce that you've never heard? No, of course not. But very few people actually do this. They think it's more complicated than rushing around to each compliance and saying, well, we've got to meet PCI in three months, let's make that happen. It's not. We've actually had customers that um, were planning on hiring, and you're going to hate me for saying this, but we've had customers that were planning on hiring uh, compliance managers and, and two or three people to make sure that they have everything, and we've implemented this program for them using just standard stuff that's freely available, just not many people dig into it. We implement this program for them, and they don't have to hire because it's just part of the way they do business. It's just the way that things happen. And that takes out a lot of the stress. You're able to complete more projects. You're able to uh, address a lot of the other needs in your environment if you just simply make sure that this is part of it, and then you marry the outside of the Venn diagram together with uh, what you have. And so that gives me two minutes. Any questions? Um, so the, it's the problem that I've seen companies face with compliance is um, actually doing it for apps. Right. So your app's not compliant, but it's generating revenue. Um, I guess how do you convince the money maker that they need to do this all the time? Like not, not at PCI time, but right after PCI time, at the next patch release, that exposes your entire network to vulnerability so, to, to do this? So that's a great question, and that's, that's something that we struggle with for a long time. We have seen a dramatic uptick in customers who, when they go out to win new business, they immediately get a vendor questionnaire back. And they say, well, great, we love your product, we want to purchase it, make sure you do this. 
And then the people are saying, if they're, you know, they've done this, they say, okay, great, here you go. Here's our security plan, here's all our controls, here's how we're meeting. If they're not, then they either lose the contract or they're going to have to run away, run around and do all these things again anyway. We've actually seen a large uptick in that. It's, it's really, yeah, so I'm, we're not the only ones. Um, there's, it's probably in the last year or so, it's been huge where um, you have, great, we want to do business with you, here's your uh, vendor questionnaire. And so if you are doing this on a daily basis, who cares, just send them what you're doing and you're good to go. If you're not, then you run around and say, well, we kind of, uh, we'll get that to you in a week, and then everybody works, you know, everybody works 25-hour days. Maybe that. Um, so that's, we've actually, uh, we've actually seen a huge uptick. And it's, it's going to spread. If they haven't seen it, it will happen to them. They'll win business, and they won't get the business because they're not, they're not ready to provide that information. In fact, I was talking to um, somebody who runs the, the uh, vendor compliance at uh, one of the brew classes. And he said, we give them two days. If they don't respond in two days, we know they're not ready. And so he said, we've had, I won't name names, but we've had, you know, vendors you've heard of. And they, they say, well, we'll take about a week to get, oh, then you're not ready. You're not doing this as part of your process. Not really a question or comment, because especially that overlap piece, uh, since I have experience on that, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of companies, especially in the Bay Area, calling these things unified controls matrix, common controls matrix. So I would encourage you all, yep. I was working with Adobe, so they made their, just Google Adobe common controls matrix, so that whole what's overlap, how do I do one assessment, but be able to do all at once. Right. Uh, they made it open source. So just Google Adobe common controls matrix so that you don't have to do this yourself. Yeah, look, uh, Google um, Crosswalk. So look at you know NIST or whatever it happens to be in Crosswalk. In fact, NIST, for example, NIST has, there's actually a, a specification, 800-66 for HIPAA. So you don't even have to look it up. They basically say, here's all the stuff extra you've got to do uh, if you're compliant with NIST. Uh, so yeah, you're exactly right. People are providing that as a service, but they're also, there's a lot of them out there who are uh, doing that. But, but again, and I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me on this, that's only part of it. Just knowing what you have to do security controls wise, that's only part. The other part is actually implementing it and putting it into daily practice. And that, that's a bit harder than just saying, do I have that, yes or no, okay, we're good. No, you're not good. You've got to put that as part of the process. So I'm way over, but if there's any other questions, feel free to uh, come down. Otherwise, uh, enjoy your lunch.